So we're going to do a recap on Chapter 7, since I didn't have the microphone um, on Tuesday. And we're going to talk about some of the items that we're just going to brief again about some of the items we talked about on Tuesday regarding incremental analysis. For the most part, incremental, incremental analysis is really trying to find the better option based on several scenarios. And in doing this incremental analysis, we're going to determine if it's potentially best for us to either make a special order, accept an order. Sometimes it's a make or buy scenario. Is it cheaper for us to make an item or to buy an item? And with that, we have to take into account potentially fixed costs that will be unused. Um, we had examples yesterday of repairing equipment or purchasing new equipment. And then there's also just eliminating um, segments that might be unprofitable. So some of the things we looked about, looked at, and I told you to remember for a quiz, is what is the first step in incremental analysis? It's important you have to identify the problem and look at various levels of responsibility, then determine possible courses of action, make a decision, and the last one isn't just to make the decision, that's the third. The fourth is to review the results of the decision you made. And we talked about an incremental analysis, while there is financial information that is considered there is also non-financial information you have to look at in determining if um, which step you're going to take. Here in managerial accounting, we are looking at financial information. But if we're going to have employees that are turning over, that's ultimately going to affect our profits. If we are going to um, end up with an image that might be um, disregarded within a company, that ultimately will play out in poor profits. So incremental analysis is not just about finances or money, it's financial and non-financial matters we really have to look into. The approach is ultimately to list various actions and determine which one among the alternative actions we're going to choose. How does it work? And guys, I'm just going through this kind of quickly, if I, there's an area you want me to highlight on, yell at me and I'll, I'll take more time on it. How does it work? We come up with alternatives and we create scenarios based on these alternatives and then we evaluate what would be better from a financial standpoint. The items that are used in incremental analysis are concepts. We have to take into account account those costs that are relevant, that are going to matter within our decision making. Who knows what opportunity cost is? Isn't it the cost you forego in order to pursue another avenue? So those of you that are in school, you've chosen this um, avenue or this, this path, but as an, uh, an example of this, you may be losing money in another um, job at the point at the moment. But the point in doing this is ultimately that your life is going to be better in the future. So the opportunity costs are things you have to take into account in, in determining which course of action. Sunk costs are costs that have already occurred. You're not going to get them back. They're done. They're sunk. How does it work? Basically, we're going to find alternatives we're going to determine the costs related to some of these alternatives and compare the results. One important piece on this slide is fixed costs sometimes change between alternatives, but variable costs really don't change under the alternatives. Variable costs you're going to have no matter what the um, particular alternative is going to be. Your fixed costs might be altered based on your alternatives. And we'll go through problems. Um, as we talk about accepting orders at special prices, 
there are times when we're going to ultimately produce a certain volume of a pr uh, product for our American market. And then we might have an opportunity of producing something maybe at a reduced cost, or excuse me, not at a reduced cost, at a reduced sale price. And we have to look and see, is it beneficial for us to continue to produce that product for a certain segment? And what could that possibly affect in our current production? And is it worth it for us to produce that alternative um, special order? Um, what is the benefit ultimately going to be for us? This was an example that we went over in class. Sunbelt produces 100,000 blenders which is 80% of pl plant capacity. Now guys, we can't take on special orders if we're at 100% capacity, can we? There's no more room. But when we're at 80% capacity, we can take a special order. Variable manufacturing costs for each smoothie or blender is eight bucks a unit. Fixed costs are 400,000 or four bucks per unit. The blenders are normally sold directly to a retailer at 20 bucks each. Sunbelt has an offer from another company, Foreign, to purchase an additional 2,000 blenders at 11 bucks per unit. Acceptance of the offer wouldn't affect normal sales of the product, and the additional units can be manufactured without increasing any plant capacity. So again, we normally produce um, 100,000, which is 80% of capacity, and we have the ability to produce an additional 2,000, but we don't, we're not going to be selling these at 20 bucks each. We're only selling them at 11. Is it worth it for us to do that? So what we do is we show the options. We show if we don't accept the order, nothing's going to change, it's all zeros, but if we do accept the order, we're going to receive 11 bucks a unit, or 22,000. With our various costs, we're still making $6,000 on the deal. Why are we having to deal with our variable units, but we're not having to deal here with our fixed overhead because we already have that taken care of in a previous. Fixed costs don't change. They're not relevant because our fixed costs are set no matter what, but our variable costs are relevant to the decision making because our fixed costs are etched in stone no matter what. It's the variable cost that will be increased. But do you see if we take this order, we're still going to be at better income? Here's another example. Cop company incurs cost of $28 a unit, 18 variable and 10 fixed to make a product. A foreign wholesaler offers to buy 5,000 of these units at 25 bucks each. Normally we, pay, um, we sell them for 42. Cobb will incur additional shipping cost of a buck per unit. Compute the increase or decrease in net income Cobb's going to realize by accepting this order. If we don't accept the order, we're at zero. Zero profit, zero additional loss or profit. If we accept it, we're going to get 5,000 units at 25 bucks a piece or $125,000. We're going to have extra costs in this deal, which is the um, variable cost of 18 bucks a unit times 5,000 units, and then our shipping cost of a buck a unit times 5,000 units. We don't mess with fixed costs here because it's not part of the, the structure. The fixed costs have already occurred. We're going to show here a profit margin here on this special order of $30,000. So if we accept it or if we reject it, what would you want to do if that special order is ultimately going to bring us $30,000? We're going to accept it. Then we have other types of incremental analysis. Do we make something or do we buy it? So here's an example of in dealing with um, producing ignition switches, we have our various um, manufacturing costs, the direct materials, labor, variable and fixed overhead, which ultimately amounts to 
nine bucks a unit to make this switch. Instead of making its own switches, Barron could purchase the ignition switch at a price of eight bucks a unit. What should management do? Okay, guys, initially you're going to look at this and go, nine versus eight? Well, buy. Gosh, we need to buy it. But why is it not that easy? Because we have fixed costs we're going to incur no matter what, right? So if you look at this, we're going to have fixed cost here of if we buy it, we're going to have our fixed manufacturing cost anyway of $50,000 plus our purchase, so we're at a $250,000 cost. But if we make it, what is our cost to make it? Two twenty-five. dollars So really, if we make it or buy it, we still have to absorb some fixed costs, don't we? So we're better off making it because of those fixed costs we're going to have. The opportunity cost is the, excuse me here, the potential benefit that can be obtained from following an alternative course of action. Another example here, assume that through buying the switches then, Barron can use the released productive capacity to generate additional income of 38000 from producing a different product. Now this lost income has to be considered in these, this make or buy decision. If we have another alternative cost, um, option, we need to look at that. So if we make it, but then we have this opportunity cost we're going to lose out on. Or if we buy it, then we, in this scenario, we're better off to, um, to buy it because we do have another option there. In Instead of making that, we can switch it to another product we can make. Now, we had this question here. In a make or buy decision, relevant costs are A, manufacturing costs that will be saved, B, the purchase price of the units, C, opportunity cost, or D, all of the above? D. Okay, so we basically went through some different uh, scenarios in understanding the manners in which we can use this incremental analysis. And then we talked about selling something or processing it further. There are times that you want to continue to process it further until that incremental revenue is not beneficial because of the incremental cost is greater than that incremental revenue. Remember we had examples such as cream or tables. This example of tables showed does this Woodmasters just finish the raw material, the raw table, and sell it, or do they put in that extra cost of completing it, finishing the wood, staining, varnishing it, <coughs> and selling it at that cost? Do you remember that problem from Tuesday? So we look initially. The cost to manufacture an unfinished table is thirty-five bucks. And we can sell that for 50. So we're making 15 bucks on a table. Woodmaster has unused capacity that can be used to finish the tables, and they can sell them for 10 more bucks. But to complete a finished table, direct materials are going to increase by two, and direct, direct labor costs are going to increase by four. So that finished table will produce us an additional 10 bucks, but it's going to cost us six more bucks in costs to produce it. So what would we do? If we processed it further, we're going to have income here instead of 15 bucks a table, we're going to have income of 1660 a table. We're going to want to process it further, aren't we? Now, in our little milk scenario, when we talk about various products coming out of one, this happens with oil too. 
they get the crude oil and they process it into various um, products. Joint product here with the creamery. Cream and skim milk are products that result from processing raw milk. So we go from raw milk, we gotta come up with these common costs that are gonna incur no matter what. Then we split it off into cream and skim. Then we can further process these um, items and either come up with cottage cheese for cream or, or condensed milk for skim milk. So we need to decide at what point is it like a, a reduction in revenues to continue to process it further. So when we look at our various products resulting from just raw milk, the joint products allocable to cream is going to be there no matter what. To just get the cream, it's going to be there. And then from there, if we just, the revenue from just cream is 19000 then the revenues from just cottage cheese is 27000 But we've got more cost to put into it to get it into cottage cheese. So should we just sell cream, or is it important for us to process it further into cottage cheese? So we look here. If we process it further, look what happens. We can sell it originally for 19, but processing it further reduces our net income down to 17,000. So if we were smart, just and cared about a financial standpoint, we're not gonna process it further, are we? It's gonna cost us too much money. We're better off making profit, just having it in cream. So in this scenario, skim milk versus condensed milk, we can look and see what it's gonna cost just for the skim or if we're gonna um, process it further into condensed milk. Same scenario, way better deal for us here, isn't it? Isn't it gonna be better financially for us to process it further into condensed milk? Better revenue for us. The decision rule is a sell or process further decision. Process further as long as the incremental revenue from processing exceeds A, incremental processing cost, B, variable processing cost, C, fixed processing cost, or D, none. Incremental revenue needs to be greater than incremental processing cost. The fixed costs are already in the equation. Okay, the fixed costs are gonna be there no matter what. So they're usually not relevant in this decision. It's the variable costs that are gonna become relevant. Um, we also can use incremental analysis in keeping the same equipment or repairing it or purchasing a new piece of equipment. So we had an example of that in um, our slideshow here, and I believe we did a problem. So what I'd like to do is, what was the last problem we worked on, guys? 710. So we talked about um, sales cost and processing further. And what was the next problem we were gonna do? So sometimes we use incremental analysis to eliminate certain products that might be um, Un, you know, unprofitable for us. Again, we're not gonna focus on those costs we're gonna have no matter what. We're gonna focus on those relevant costs, which usually are those variable costs. And fixed costs are allocated to the unprofitable segment are gonna have to be absorbed by other segments. Net income may decrease when an unprofitable segment is eliminated. So we have to sometimes decide, are we going to keep a certain segment or is it beneficial for us to possibly replace that segment or just overall eliminate it and get absorbed in other areas? 
Here's our example. And then we're going to do a problem like this. Venus Company manufactures three models of tennis rackets. Right now we have Pro and Master, which are profitable. But Champ is not a Champ. Champ's not doing that well, guys. We've got a $20,000 loss here with Champ. So we've got to decide, can we take this $30,000 in costs here? And can we do something else with this $30,000 in costs? Or should we just keep Champ going? So the way in which you look at it, you look and you compare the information. If we allocate the um, costs to the, the fixed cost to the other lines, look how our income went down 10,000. And you can tell that the income went down 10,000 because look here, if we, excuse me here, if we eliminating it, if we continue, we have a $20,000 loss with CHAMP. If we eliminate it, all of these fixed costs need to be absorbed somewhere else, so we end up with a $30,000 loss because we're going to have that cost no matter what. So in this scenario, it's better for us to, even though it's losing money, to keep producing it because to quit producing it, we're going to lose even more money due to our fixed costs. If an unprofitable segment is eliminated, the fixed expenses allocated to the eliminated segment need to get absorbed by the other segments. And you have to look into how that's going to play out in your income in the long haul. Let's do another one. Lambert manufactures several types of accessories. For the year, the knit hats and scarves line has sales of 400000 Variable expenses of 310 and fixed expenses of 120 Therefore, the knit halves and scarves line has a loss of 30. If Lambert eliminates the knit halves and scarves, 20,000 of the fixed costs will remain. Let's do an analysis to see should we eliminate the hats, hats and scarves or continue them. What do you think, guys? Eliminate. eliminate. We're going to have a loss either way, but at least our loss is better. Okay. When is this time to move to a new neighborhood? <laughs> if you've ever moved, then you know how complicated and costly it can be. Consider what it would be like for a manufacturing company with 260 employees and 170,000 square foot facility to move from Southern California to Ohio Idaho. This is what Buck Knives did in order to save its company from financial devastation. Electricity rates in Idaho were half those in California. Workers' comp was one-third the cost. Factory wages were 20% lower. Combined, this would reduce manufacturing costs by $600,000 a year. But moving the factory costs $8.5 million plus $4 million to move the key employees. Offsetting these costs was the estimated $11 million selling price of the California proper property. Based on these estimates, the move would pay for itself over three years. Ultimately, the company only received $7.5 million for the California property, and only 58 of the 75 key employees were willing to move. Construction was delayed by a year, which caused the new plant to increase $1.5 million um, pricing, and wages surged in Iowa due to low employment. Despite all of these complications, the company considers the move a great success. What were some of the factors that complicated the company's decision to move? How should the company have incorporated such factors into its incremental analysis? What could they have done, guys? They probably should have realized not everyone's going to pick up and move, right? Some of those items, and they should have been realistic as far as what the price of that a property really could sell for. Don't you have to be aware of the what-ifs? In a perfect world, how many times does it work perfectly? In a perfect world, it might, but in my world, it's not very perfect. You have to always account for the what-ifs and the, the potential issues. Um, 
What are qualitative factors? The non-financial factors. The effects of decisions on existing employees and the community. Cost savings that can be obtained from outsourcing. Or cost of loss morale. What happens when morale is low? You don't work as hard. What else? Have you guys ever worked at a company you don't like? No? What happens? You tend to not really want to give it your all, do you? Can you see how, in a lot of respects, when you're treated right by an employer, it does increase productivity? Isn't it amazing? And when you feel that there's a sense of camaraderie, how it's beneficial for everyone involved? And the opposite can be true, too. When you feel like they're just on you and hounding you, it doesn't always work. Sometimes that motivates some people. I know it doesn't motivate me. Independence kind of helps motivate me. We all are motivated in different ways, aren't we? I really want to know where you got that hat, Bethany. <laughs> got it's cute. Okay. So let's take a look at the problem we were going to do. That was problem what? 716. So if we go to 716, does anyone have the, um, or was it 714? I don't have 716 on here. Okay, I'll just start it here. 716. So let's talk about this problem. Um, page, let me exit here. And what page is this? Okay, so here we've got Kali Company makes three models of tasers. Information on the products are shown below. <coughs> Tingler, Shocker, and Stunner. <laughs> Fixed expenses consist of 300000 in common costs allocated to the three products based on relative sales and additional fixed expenses of 30000 for Tingler, 80000 for Shocker, and 35000 for Stunner. The common costs will be incurred regardless of how many models are produced. The other fixed expenses would be eliminated if a model's phased out. James Watt, the, an executive with the company, feels the Stunner line should be discontinued to increase the company's net income. So we need to compute the current net income in this scenario, okay? What's the date today? Six, I gotta write that down. Today is March 6th. Ah. Okay, so Let's start by producing, showing the, compute the current net income for Kali Corporation Company. This is going to be easy, isn't it? How do we calculate the net income right now? 30 plus 70 minus 40. So we're going to start by showing the net income is going to be this, well, who's the first one, Tingler? And this is Shocker, and the other one, Cowley, or no. Okay, so we've got here, Tingler is at how much? 30,000? 
70 and stunner. So we've got a summary here of, oops. Sixty thousand, right? Now the next question asks us: Compute net income by product line and in total for Kali if the company discontinues the Stunner product line. Hint: Allocate the three hundred thousand common costs to the two min remaining product lines based on their relative sales. So we've got this three hundred thousand in the fixed cost that's going to go between all of them. And remember how Tingler has 30,000 of fixed, Shocker has 80, and Stunner has 35. So what we need to do here, bless you, is we're going to go here and show now we're going to have Tingler, Shocker, And this one's going to be total. Okay. So what are our sales? Tingler is how many dollars? Shocker? Total, 800. What are our variable expenses for Tingler? 150. What about Shocker? 200 then our contribution margin Contribution margin again? Sales minus what? Variable expenses. Now we have to look at our fixed expenses. Let's just take the fixed expenses designated to each. Tingler's fixed expenses designated to each is what? What is that? 200? I'm sorry. Is that right? How much fixed expenses were designated specifically to Tingler? 120. And how many were designated specifically to Shocker? Okay, wait. Okay. What I'm saying is, do you remember it said here? Fixed expenses straight to Tingler were 30,000, straight to Shocker were 80. So let's do that one first, okay? This was 30, this was 80. Now we need to fixed expenses designated on sales, you know? And what did we know that um, it was going to be $300,000, right? So this one was going to be. Um, th 300,000 300,000 of sales and we're going to multiply that by the difference of 300,000 divided by 800,000 so what's that going to show us? It's going to be 300,000 300,000, and then it's going to be, whoops, 300,000, shoot, let me, the 300,000 sales, and then we're going to divide that by 300,000, which is the revenue divided by 800,000, right? God, what am I doing wrong? Okay.
what am I doing? Okay, so I'm going to do equals. If I take 300,000, divide that by 800,000, okay? And then I multiply that. I multiply that times 300,000. 112,250 should be allocated to Tingler. And then we should be able to do the same thing over here. But what we're going to do different is instead of divide that by 300,000, they made 500,000, right? Whoops. This is 187.5, and this one was how much? 112? Five. Am I doing something wrong? Does that total three hundred thousand? Yep. Our sales are five hundred thousand. We divide that by eight hundred thousand to figure out that percent of sales. We multiply it times this fixed cost of 300000 okay? So then, basically, our net income is going to be our 150 minus these two. Didn't like I did it that way. That. That. Minus. That. Minus. That. 7,500. And this one should be 32,5. And this is 40,000. So now our new net income is 40000 What was our new net income, or what was our net income if we kept Stunner in? Should we keep Stunner, or should we get rid of Stunner? We should keep it, shouldn't we? Do you understand the purpose of keeping it is because those fixed costs need to be allocated elsewhere? Does that make sense? Okay, if we go to C, should Colley eliminate the Stunner product line? No. Why? We're going to not have money with that, with it. With, we're going to make less money if we eliminate it. Any questions on that? Does it make sense? How are we doing, guys? Isn't this fun? <laughs> yes. You bet. What's the next problem? I encourage you guys to look at some of these um, problems to make sure if we did have matching for you that you understand how this works, okay? How do you guys like the matching on the test? Love it? How many hate it? Okay, let's look at 7-1. This is dealing with if we accept an order or if we reject an order, okay? Sure Shot Sports Inc. manufactures basketballs for the National Basketball Association. For the first six months of 2014, the company reported the following operating results while operating at 80% of plant capacity and producing 120,000 units. We've got sales of 4800000 we 
We've got cost of goods of 3.6 and selling an admin of 405. Fixed cost for the period were cost of goods, fixed cost for the period were cost of goods sold 960,000 and selling and administrative expenses of 225. <coughs> In July, normally a slack manufacturing month, Sure Shot Sports receives a special order for 10,000 basketballs at 27 bucks each from the Greek Basketball Association. Acceptance of the order would increase variable selling and administrative expenses 50 cents per unit because of shipping costs, but would not increase fixed costs and expenses. We need to prepare an incremental analysis for that special order. So what is the information we are gonna use in order to create that? <coughs> the cost of goods sold. And we're gonna only use the variable pieces here, are we? To accept or reject the order. So let's look here. So if I show you I don't have 7-1 in here either. What the heck did I do? Okay, so if we take here, um, we're gonna have here revenues, cost of goods sold, Selling and admin expenses and net income. So we've got over here, if we reject the order, if we accept the order, and our either net income increase or decrease. So if we reject the order, we're just zeros all the way, okay? If we accept the order, how much more money is that gonna give us? Hmm? 270,000. And our cost of goods sold would be what? Let's look at this. Out of this 3,600,000, how much did they say were fixed? 960,000 of those are fixed. So we'll know the difference is variable, don't we? Right? And so if we know the difference is variable, how many do we normally produce? We normally produce 120,000. So let's calculate what our variable costs are. So our variable costs are gonna be equal to 3,600,000. We're gonna subtract out our fixed cost of 960,000. And that gives us 2640000 right? A variable cost? If we take that 2640000 and divide that by how many units? 120,000 units? How much does that mean per unit? You guys are getting a little sleepy in here. I kind of am too. 22 bucks a unit, do you guys get that? 22 bucks a unit. Then, if we figure what is our 10,000 units, we wanna make a special unit, times 22 bucks a unit, how much is that gonna be? 220. Right? So 270 minus our 220 
What are our selling and administrative expenses that are variable? Selling and admin variable are going to be what? Let's go back here. It tells us acceptance of the order would increase our variable selling and admin expenses by 50 cents per unit, right? But it's not going to increase anything else. But it also tells us that our selling and admin expenses um, that were fixed were 225, right? So we're going to take our normal selling and admin of 405, won't we? So we'll take our 405 we'll subtract out those fixed expenses of 225 and that equals variable selling and admin of 180. If we take that 180 and divide it by our 120,000 units, what does that give us per unit? Dollar fifty a unit, and then didn't it tell us it's going to cost us a little more because we have to ship them? So this order is going to be a buck fifty plus fifty cents, or an extra two bucks a unit, right? <coughs> Times ten thousand units is going to equal ah twenty thousand bucks. So here we've got 20,000 bucks. So what's our net income here? Number three says our should sure shot sports accept the special order? Why? We're making more money, aren't we? Net income's gonna increase by thirty thousand, won't it? Right? Number C says, what is the minimum selling price on the special order to produce net income of four bucks per ball? How are we gonna figure that out? To make four dollars a ball, what are we going to do? What are our cost of goods sold? 22 bucks a, a ball, right? What are our other variable costs here? Two bucks a ball, right? That's 24. And then if we want to make four bucks a ball, what do we need to sell it for? Guys, I think you know it. 22 plus 2 plus 4. 28? Does that make sense? Next. What non-financial factors should management consider in making this decision? Should they worry? if that could at all affect our domestic sales to the NBA? 
Chances are it's not going to because this is the Greek Basketball Association, right? Is there a Greek as Basketball Association? There is. Um, so we have to worry about that. What else would we worry about? Could we work, worry about other alternative opportunities to increase it, the demand? Get it? You guys are cracking me up. <laughs> Okay, what's the last problem we're doing? That was the last one. Should we start on chapter eight? What? This is seven. How are you guys doing with this? Does it make sense? Can I tell you right now that you will have one problem? I'll just tell you real quick what it's going to be. Does that help when I tell you what it's going to be? Yeah, never mind. I won't tell you. I'm trying to think here what it is. I don't have it in here. I'm, I will let you know when I create the quiz, I'll say you are going to have a problem for make or buy or you'll have a problem related to this, okay? Any questions, concerns? How are you guys doing? You doing okay? Should I go a little faster for you? Slower? Cover more? Cover less? You want me to cover more? I'm happy to do whatever you guys want. What? <laughs> I was gonna. Uh, hun honey clip videos. <laughs> funny one later. Okay, guys, um, we can start with chapter seven or we can call it a day. It's your call. How many want to go on to chapter seven? Okay, guess what? We're calling it a day. Well, I don't know if I'm nice or I'm being a little lazy today. So guys, Tuesday, we're going to be here. We're going to kick some you-know-what on Chapter 7. Oh, 8. That's right. And then we're going to have the test open if I get the appropriate email on Wednesday. We'll finish up with 8. And we're not, guess what, guys? We're not having class. Guess when? The next week. Okay? I know. You guys.